Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the program, we're going to look back at the mobilization that brought the world the global march for climate justice. What went into it? What are some of the lessons that activists are taking from it? And where does that movement go next? Joining me to discuss the future for the climate justice movement, Gopal Dianani and Cindy Wisner from CJA, the Climate Justice Alliance. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's start. Cindy, you were there. Uh, take us back. Those, was, those were some extraordinary hours on the streets of Manhattan. And that march was actually a globally coordinated march with actions happening all over the world. I think what we saw in the streets of New York, what we saw in the streets around the world, was really um, one, the vibrancy and uh, the, the creative imagination and also just uh, the people power that um, we want change. And I think that that was uh, an incredible um, moment that I think is gonna give us a lot of um, opportunities and openings. You put global justice first. It was a global justice movement. It's called in a lot of the press a, a climate march. What's the distinction? Okay. Um, I think that's a, a really that's a really good observation. Um, there there has been um, what I think is a really important transition in um, in the the discussion about climate, in which a new center of gravity in the social movement around climate change is to recognize the economic, social, political, racial justice, gender justice dimensions of it as central to the crisis, and we are now at a place where um, not just issue silos are getting break broken down, but entire sort of movement mythologies are getting broken down. The global justice movement, the anti-war movement, the climate movement. We are now part of a much larger, more systemic movement that really sees the interrelationships between all of these systems and how climate disruption is, um, a, is a one manifestation of that. We see this as a growing movement around systems change, not climate change, and trying to really put forward, build our, our political perspective, our alliances, our networks, and our agenda. And so when, you know, uh, uh, things like cl climate smart agriculture, uh, REDS, um, you know, the corporate capture of, of climate continues to happen in these spaces that we are posing the alternatives, mm -hmm. that we are saying the we're very clear about what we're saying no to, but we're also beginning to lift up what we're saying yes to. And I think that's what's also very exciting is these paradigm shifts that are happening and these actual examples of local living economies from our work here in the U.S. around just transition um, to what's happening in the Andean region around Buen Vivir to what's happening in Europe around the great transition and the commons movement and deglobalization. And so I think that's an exciting moment. And so mm -hmm. as we fight against these agendas, does, we're also very clear about what we need to build. And so the social movements are having much more articulation like they never have before, uh, that like they haven't had in a while. <laughs> um, you know, um, as, a, as a good sort of hook, um, utilizing these, these climate negotiations as a hook to be able to build our power globally. And how would you describe the differences between the groups in your alliance mm -hmm. and the groups that people are familiar with in the Money Media, Sierra Club, mm -hmm. Green Peace. Yeah, so I think a lot of our groups of are long have been long time, in a lot of ways embedded and come from um, communities that we say are frontline communities and fence line communities. People who have been organizing, um, you know, uh, organizing around uh, like the Peabody Coal Company in Black Mesa, uh, Arizona, or the uh, communities like APEN and Communities for a Better Environment in Richmond fighting against the Chevron refinery. Um, here, uh, folks fighting against the incinerator in Detroit. Um, also, uh, EMIAC fighting against uh, the incinerator and the food deserts that exist there. And so, in a lot, it's usually led by people of color. It's usually led by working class folks. It usually does work. Um, you know, it's like we, we, we do work it with a, we do a lot with a lot of, with a, not too many resources, but I think what we do is bring the intersection of the issues that our communities face um, and have, have a bigger kind mm -hmm. of systems change um, analysis, right, and make the interconnections around, you know, the fights against uh, the, the toxics and the dumpings that happen to police brutality, to issues at the workplace, because I think people really see it as integrated. So how does that change the demands that come out of a, a mobilization like this? People said there were no demands. I saw a lot, actually, on the streets of New York. Yeah, that's right. Um, 
I think there's a there's a few very key things that are different. For one thing, um, there is you know there is a growing public sense of urgency around climate, but that urgency has been with folks on the front lines of this fight for a very long time. And in fact, the kinds of uh, struggles that people have been engaged in and the kinds of victories uh, folks have been have, having are the solutions that we need. Grassroots organizing has kept more industrial carbon out of the atmosphere than any state or federal policy to date. Give in the us United an example how. So, for example, there hasn't been a mass waste incinerator built in the United States in over 15 years. That we're shutting down coal fired power plants on a regular basis, that we're stopping the communities across rural parts of America are actually stopping fracking by taking local action and passing rights of nature ordinances that are asserting their right to be free of these. Um, of these impacts. And at the same time, folks are building an economy in their communities that can sustain them as the solution. And that's where I think what was really different about this mobilization is that it wasn't just a mobilization about being against something. It was a mobilization about being for something, being for an economy that works for people on the planet. Well, we can point to the communities across this country who have been building not just new social movement relationships, but new economic power and political power in their communities. Whether it's folks who are taking on um, food systems transformation as a struggle against the extractive industries, communities who are, um, who are advocating for community controlled public power as, a, as an antidote to the investor owned utilities. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of solutions that are coming from grassroots organizations and their allies across this country. And yet there were criticisms, and criticisms from the left, from Chris Hedges, Arun Gupta, people who said that kind of movement mission for radical social transformation is incompatible with a PR-driven, corporate-friendly grass top, if you will, of a march like uh, the climate march in, in New York. Well, I think um, social movements are so much more complicated than people want to admit, for one thing. Um, and I actually think there's some really important values mm -hmm. that come out of um, uh, something like the mobilization and the role that um, that the Climate Justice Alliance and GGJ, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, which brought together a lot of the international folks who participated, which is it's a snapshot of where the social movement is at mm -hmm. and where is the center of gravity in the climate movement right now. Mm -hmm. and you know. Um, back in Copenhagen, which pro was probably our last major massive mobilization around climate, the center of gravity in the movement was, I think, um, um, a minefield of false solutions. Um, the, you know, we were, folks carbon were advocating trading. carbon trading, folks were advocating anything. Anything is better than nothing, which of course, as we know, almost oh, always leads to okay. nothing or worse than nothing. This time, the center of gravity of the movement was grassroots organizing, was frontline communities, was alliances between um, communities of color, indigenous communities, working class white folks. Like you saw a different face of the movement mm -hmm. and you saw cooperation between, um, between folks like the Climate Justice Alliance, us and Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and others working with the folks that flood Wall Street in a, in a relationship that was one of accountability, of shared messaging. That, that that's so something both, that we didn't see before. So yeah. both the peaceful march and rally and the planned civil disobedience street blocking down at Wall yeah. Street. Right. Which was also peaceful. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> I, and I think that that was significant because I feel like part of what ended up happening was that um, the Climate Justice Alliance put out a call because for us it's never been just about the mobilization. Mm -hmm. And I think our message um, with um, even the, the organizing committee of the mobilization, the National Organizing Committee, like it, for us it was really important to say it is as important how we build the road to the mobilization what happens in the mobilization, but actually more important, what happens afterwards. And I think that that message around, you know, if there's gonna be any resources that are gonna be raised, like how do we then think about, like how are we building up our bases in the process? How are we building our power? How are we building in a qualitatively different way to do that? So I think that was very important. The second thing is that we made a call to action around um, the Climate Justice Alliance made a, a call to action that people took up. Um, and, and, and it was the former, you know, uh, brothers and sisters from Occupy um, that really said, you know what, we want to be accountable and in relationship mm -hmm. in a different way. And I think they took up the call to action and I think the direct 
action community really struggled around like, well, we just want to disrupt, uh, you know, business as usual, which is absolutely what we agree with. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of the, the, the folks there were struggled internally to say, but we want to be in relationship to folks. And we want to bring capitalism as the bigger systemic, naming it as the as the systems uh, issue that we're facing. But how do we also build with frontline communities? And so it was uh, there was invitations made to international social movement activists and organizers to local and national to then be part of helping shape that action and the and what happened on the streets. So that's the relationship with the people, if you will, in sort of clumsy strokes to the left of you. Mm -hmm. What about the people to the right of you? Mm -hmm. How do you protect yourselves and your organizations and the people you represent mm -hmm. and their mission mm -hmm. and their daily needs um, from just being kind of people of color faces mm -hmm. in a march that at the end of the day mm -hmm. is going to get behind corporate endorsed solutions. How do you make sure you're not just getting used? I think I think there's uh, there's two kinds of big tent politics. There's one kind of big tent politic, which is the least common denominator politic. And that's dangerous. That's the idea that in order for us to all come together, we all have to agree to the thing that is, you know, is everyone can agree to. The other kind of big tent politic is I am prepared to play with anyone. We are prepared to engage with anyone, but we are going to bring our full politics. We're going to be very clear about what we're about, what we're demanding, what the solutions are, and we're going to navigate that and struggle with you in that. And in the end, we're going to stand together and and see how this plays out in the in the movement, which is, the, again, this idea of what's the center of gravity that emerges. Um, and you will find that folks are more open than we think, a lot of them. And we're not going to get everybody. There are some, um, some mainstream environmental groups that are actually just corporate front groups. And then there are groups like 350 that are, that are ready to think about what that bigger alliance is that we're trying to build. What's the, what's the common ground that we can move forward? And I think one of the things that's really important, and I'll let Cindy, I'll let you speak to this, is one of the follow-ons to, the, um, to the People's um, Climate March and then Flood Wall Street and then the tribunals, which you can speak to, was also delivering our demands as a global social movement um, uh, to the UN and saying this is, this is what needs to happen. You either do it or get out of the way kind of approach, mm -hmm. which um, we don't need the permission of everybody else to assert the solutions that we know we need. Um, and so I think that was, again, it's not, it's not an either or. We're not going to influence those forces by not engaging them. Mm -hmm. We're going to influence those forces by coming into it with our own power. Um, and I think that's what we're, that's what's really happening now. And that's what you're seeing. And I, I just want to say there were contingents at the People's Climate March that were about prison abolition, that were, that were connecting uh, policing and prisons to climate disruption, that were connecting banks and housing foreclosure to climate disruption, that were um, connecting homelessness to climate disruption. People are making the connection, seeing if you have the systemic view, then you can see how the pieces fit together. Mm -hmm. And people were making that connection. And we haven't seen that in a mainstream climate mobilization before. And that, I think, is really important. And we shouldn't as the left always jump to the easy critique we should actually look for what it tells us about mm -hmm. where we are as a movement right now and build on that assessment mm -hmm. our power is also the name of a campaign you that want to tell right. us about it go fall yeah sure um so we are the climate justice alliance which we are both um, part of grassroots global justice and movement generation along with 40 other organizations mostly grassroots organizations around this country are engaged in a campaign around this notion of just transition how do you build a new kind of economy from the bottom up in communities that is both about economic muscle and political muscle, that we can actually model the better way forward. Um, and it's called the Our Power Campaign. And when we say power, we mean energy, work, democracy, all the different kinds of power that matter in a community. And um, so the question of where do, where, what comes next, in, in a way, it's like there's been this ongoing work that we, that we are building on at this moment, but that has been going on for many, many years, which is this, the important work of grassroots organizing. And, um, and, that, and folks are engaged not in just um, a campaign that's about fighting against what you don't like, but actually building what you know is needed in such a way that actually creates uh, um, what, what, we, um, what we think of as a visionary and oppositional economy that's visionary in that it's an economy for life, that people, people want to participate 
And it's oppositional, not in the sense that it talks about what's bad, but that it actually contests for resources. Mm -hmm. Everything from our actual labor to governance, to headspace, to heart space, it, it's, um, it's, that's the kind of power we're trying to build across all those different domains. And so you have um, very, very local strategies, but that are connected across communities through a unified vision, shared strategies and common frames. Can you give us one example? Sure, um, and there's a great, um, we've done a great um, video about it, um, but there's um, a, uh, a good example is in Black Mesa, Arizona, the Black Mesa Water Coalition is one of our core partners, um, is um, indigenous organizing on the Navajo Nation. And they've been fighting Peabody Coal and a coal-fired power plant called the Navajo Generating Station. And um, they, instead of just constantly fighting against those industries, they're actually engaged in a campaign to build um, a, a solar transition for the for the Navajo Generating Station that would be owned and um, and benefit uh, would be owned by the Navajo people, and that that would then generate the resources for them to advance their traditional lifeways economy. Okay. At the same time, they're doing they're bringing back their traditional lifeways around um, or supporting building the economic infrastructure around the wool economy, which is the, a traditional economy for them. Their um, dry land farming systems, all of these things that actually make meaning are part of how they, as a community, make meaning of the world in which they live. And if people want to plug in, so ourpower.org, um, uh, you can go to Movement Generations also website, which is movementgeneration.org, or you can go to the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance website, which is ggjalliance.org. Alliance in Action. Thank you both, Cindy right. Gopal. Great to have you. Let's take a look at that video from Black Mesa and a whole lot more still to come on the show. Thanks for coming here. Under Black Mesa is the Navajo Aquifer, so it's the sole source of drinking water in this whole region. It's prehistoric water. You can take it right from a stream and it's better and cleaner and healthier for you than bottled water. When a spring isn't replenishing, it really has an impact on our spirituality and our way of life. A lot of our work for Black Mesa Water Coalition has been about how we protect our aquifer from companies like Peabody Coal Company. They still use about 1,400 acre feet of water for their mining operations. We started to see the physical impacts. Springs were drying up. Peabody was using Navajo's water for coal mining, which fed the generating station. It's called the Navajo Generating Station. It's on Navajo land. People assume that we own it, but we don't own it. There's really not a lot of economic opportunities, especially in where, where our world is at today. If we really want to continue to live in our communities, but at some point, we have to show that it is possible. That's why just transition is important. We are not about shutting down the mine, shutting down the plant, and losing all of these jobs. A just transition to me means we're intentional about ending the fossil fueling economy in a way that builds up an alternative economy that benefits our people. We're here at the Our Power Camp that we've hosted along with the Climate Justice Alliance. We're here to come up with strategies to deal with the coal industry kind of across the whole sector. We're gonna be focused on three communities. We call it hot spots. Black Mesa here is the region that we've picked as one hot spot. The next gathering is gonna be in Richmond where they're dealing with oil refineries and then in Detroit and other areas where they've been dealing with energy empires. We have a strong focus on how can we bring in our Navajo people into the work that we're doing and how can we get support from non-Navajo communities and organizations. There's a lot of representation here at this gathering from Appalachia, um, Alaska, Powder River Basin, Black Mesa, Oakland, Detroit, Phoenix, Tucson. A lot of our communities are dealing with these extractive industries in our backyard, whether it's fracking, natural gas, coal development, coal mining, coal-fired power plants, oil refineries. We are dealing with the same corporations. We are dealing with the same policies, the energy policies. The Navajo Generating Station powers the 300-mile canal from Lake Havasu area to so Phoenix and Tucson. It's called the Central Arizona Project. They call it CAP. What our solution is is that we can power CAP with solar. All the lands on Black Mesa who have already gone through mining and are in various stages of reclamation and can't be used for anything else. Can't we put solar on those areas? There's existing transmission lines, there's existing infrastructure. And can we as Navajo people be owners 
of that. As the Climate Justice Alliance, we made a decision that whenever we get together, we have to throw down for what community that we're in. So what we want to do is we want to have a big action to educate people about what resources are being taken from here, what are the costs of this lifestyle that they live in Southern Arizona. Also to push forward our idea that to move water through the cap to power the Southwest, it can be done with solar. We're gonna take a solar panel, a nice big one, and we're gonna take our water barrels, and we're gonna take our water pumps, and we're gonna start pumping it back into our barrels using solar. Something that was reinforced for me was that we don't have to just let things happen to us, and we have support from all over the country, and there's many communities that are just like us. We can work together. The Just Transition to me looks like our communities having the ability to decide what kind of economy we want. A transition toward a system that values human life. Where people can live healthy and safe. There is a way that we can have well-being and thriving communities with meaningful work. There are other ways to generate this electricity cleaner, safer, and more sustainably. I think Arizonans would be happy with getting their electricity and their water from renewable energy. There can be power without pollution and energy without injustice. The time is now, we're at a crossroads and continue on this like business as usual path or we can create solutions for our future generations. <laughs>《Buy》is out with a new book, and it's bound to be a good read. *Buy* rarely opens his mouth without something interesting and entertaining coming out of it. For his next trick, *Buy* writes about the humiliation of Gary Hart, a media moment he sees as seminal in the deep decline of political journalism. In '88, Hart was the Democratic Party's frontrunner until reporters working on a tip staked out his every move and turned up what looked a whole lot like an extramarital affair. Reporter Matt Bai describes Hart's downfall as a disaster, not just for the candidate, but for U.S. elections thenceforth. An event he calls the, quote, first in a seemingly endless parade of exaggerated scandals and public floggings that have done a good deal to drive good talent out of politics. I can't help wishing Bai had also looked at the race that preceded Hearts, when the writing was on the wall, but the candidate was a woman. If the 88 race marked a media fall, the 84 one was a jump off the high dive into campaign gutter tactics. While it's barely recalled in media accounts now, in 84, when Geraldine Ferraro ran for vice president, pickets followed her every step and did their best to drown out her speeches with their heckling. VP for death was a favorite slogan. The language went down from there. The GOP said they had nothing to do with the Ferraro thugs, of course. An audio tape proved different. On it, pickets could be heard being trained by party operatives to say, I'm a concerned citizen, instead of I'm with students for Reagan. Matt Bai blames technology and the proliferation of satellite news for the downward spiral of election coverage. But what the old media lacked in furious speed, they more than made up for in 1984 with the fury of their Ferraro hatred. It's all worth noting as we wrap up one election and horribly, inevitably rush into another where a woman just may be on the ballot. Suffice to say, watch out. The gutter tactics we use on women today have a habit of coming back to haunt everyone. Tell me what you think. Write to me, Laura, at GritTV.org. Thanks. Universities treat campus sexual assault like a PR problem mm. instead of a human rights problem. And so the incentive for campuses is to sweep it under the rug because they don't want it to make them look bad. And it's really student activists that have been doing a lot of work
Economic motive is at the center of American war making empire, the surveillance state. Um, I think it's something like 75 to 80 percent of the surveillance budget goes to private corporations. So when you talk about surveillance spending, it doesn't go into the NSA, it goes to Booz Allen and Hamilton or um, all of the different uh, surveillance corporations around the world.